Now, please welcome our moderator, Dave Calhoun, and our guests, Gemma Arterton and Tamsin Gregg. Very good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Apple Store here in Regent Street. Welcome to you two as well. I'm pretty guessing that nobody here will have seen the film so far, because it opens on Friday. Um, so I just want to recount a little bit about what, what the film is uh, and what, what the clips are from before we start talking about it. Uh, the film is an adaptation of a comic strip that ran in The Guardian from late 2005 to late 2007 by Posey Simmons. Um, and it was adapted by uh, a screenwriter called Moira Buffini into the film which we're going to be talking about this evening. It's, to describe it, I'd, I'd call it, it's a kind of rural, anti-pastoral, uh, anti anti-bucolic rural comedy. It's all set in um, a village in southern England, sh shot in Dorset, very picture postcard on the surface, rural England. Uh, we meet a family, a uh, married couple called Beth and Nicholas Hardiman. Tamsin plays Beth Hardiman, who run a literary circle in the village. Um, and after we meet some of the, the ensemble of characters, Gemma's character, Tamara Drew, uh, turns up and she's left the village a few years beforehand. Yeah. Um, and since then she's gained a new nose, she's gained a <laughs> career and she's gained confidence. And so those who knew her beforehand are fairly surprised. And her, her presence in the village starts to sort of change some of the relationships between people, cause some, cause some upsets, wouldn't you say? Yes, that's yeah. right. Um, begin by asking both of you to talk about your character. So Gemma, you are Tamara Drew as described in the film. What, what was it about the character that you... Well, how, when you first read the script, what, what, how, how did you feel about her? What, what, what did you come away thinking she was, who um, she was? At first, at first, I didn't like her at all, and I, I wasn't sure if I wanted to do the job, actually, because mm. of her character. I didn't know if I could empathise with her, because um, she's very manipulative, and um, in, the, in the graphic novel especially, she's... Uh, she, I don't know, she's, she's cold and, um, and uh, however in the film we managed to make it different and she's, um, she's loosely based on Bathsheba from Far From The Madding Crowd um, who's, you know, she, actually she's very similar to Bathsheba um, um, and um, yeah, so charming, manipulative but ultimately utterly lost and um, insecure <laughs> utterly and uh, having a bit of a crisis actually um and so all of the her her charm and you know sexual prowess she's very sensual sexual um is actually just a cover up and it's like a mask it's, a, it's the, what she knows how to do very well <laughs> your, your, your character as we'll see actually in the first clip makes a very powerful entrance into the, <laughs> in, into the film and it's in that, that one image and that one scene kind of sums up the kind of how she starts upsetting the natural order of this village. And Beth, I mean, it's, um, sorry, Tamsin, your character Beth is, um, you know, is one, of, one of the things that represents the natural order of this village. I mean, your, your character is um, a long-suffering housewife who runs this literary retreat with her husband, who you know, is frankly, frankly a bit of a ter pretty terrible character, who we, we know he's a philanderer, he's conceited, he's very sure of himself. Um, he's called Nicholas, played by Roger Allen. And you're, we, we see your character in that first clip reacting to, um, to, 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 uh, to Tamara's entrance. What was it about like, your, your character, I can imagine, there's so many times when I was watching the film, because she, she apologises for her husband so much through her behaviour, she uh, pretends not to see things that were obviously going on in her personal life in terms of his adultery. You, you must have wanted to shake your character you know, sort of by, by the hair and pull, pull her hair out many times during the film. Yeah, it's not nice hair, so I mean, I would really <laughs> love to have pulled it off. Uh, there was something about it that made me as a person, I want to shake her and tell mm. her to, you know, open her eyes and, and smell the coffee, and um, if you can smell coffee with your eyes. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I was really uh, challenged by, the, um, by, by playing somebody who I didn't agree with. And, uh, and the more you look at, and it's also hard not to judge somebody as well. You know, you go, you go in with your, your kind of your judgment, and you go, well, don't, you know, don't behave mm. like that. Mm. And so you, you kind of have to shelve one prejudice after another and, and try and discover why people allow their husbands to uh, serially um, muck about with other, with other women. And, uh, and I think that there is a complicity in that kind of, uh, the complicity of duplicity of people going, no, I'm, I'm going to agree to lie 
in the same way that you're lying by just not facing the truth. You, you mentioned that your, um, your, your hair isn't, you, you weren't so impressed by your character's hair in the film. So you, you had to suffer a wig and, and it wasn't, and, and particular clothes. And, <laughs> yeah. Go on, say it, a fat suit. <laughs> a, a fat suit. <laughs> it was a fat suit. They did create a slightly uh, a wider contour. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I had a fat bum in it. <laughs> well, there's a... <laughs> <laughs> well, there is a great line, one of the young, uh, with the young girls who you see, the audience sees the world through their eyes. And one of the lines is they're walking away, she goes, oh, I feel sorry for her there. I know I feel sorry for her, but she's walking away, she goes, got fat ass though. And she, <laughs> so basically, I just sort of created this character around somebody who's, who's just slightly let herself go because her eye is on everybody else. Sure. Well, let, let's see the first clip, and I think everything we've just been talking about there will become a bit more clear. <laughs> I think, I think you can see in that clip that one of the things that Stephen Frears does with this film is he, he gives you on one level a very um, a positive, shiny, sunny portrait of the countryside. And as you see there, the sun's out, the beautiful fences and fields, etc. Um, but then the other side, he sort of give, he gives you the underbelly, you know, the, sort of the, the, the bitchiness of your, of your character talking about Tamara walking in. I wonder if you, um, Tamsin, that's something that obviously comes from, from the comic strip. Tomorrow Drew by Posey Simmons. Were you were you aware of the comic strip? I, did, I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't read it when it was uh, when it was published in the Guardian. Um, but I, I read it as a graphic novel alongside the the script when I was uh, when I was sent the script. It was just really wonderful to have a kind of visual resource to to mm. have alongside the script. It's a little bit like reading a script and listening to a piece of music at the same time. That you have a kind of a different sensory um, perception of of the world and the characters. I heard Stephen Frears said somewhere the other day that he found it quite ironic that obviously there's an ongoing trend at the moment to adapt certain sort of graphic novels and here he was adapting a comic strip and a graphic novel but the sort of a complete of a completely different sort from the, from the sort of graphic novels that we you know, that we, that we see ended up on screen as action movies and blockbusters and this is something very British you know very local very intelligent as well how, how do you Gemma how, how, let's start with you actually in, in terms of playing a character that began that began life on, as a you know as a drawing as a character on the page. How, how did does that, does that in any way affect how you how you played her or how you saw her? Yeah, it's yeah. a gift actually because you know it's a, a really clear and be you know <laughs> beautifully illustrated um, starting point, mm. and you get so much which you wouldn't get in a script of you know a reaction to something and in the, in the uh, graphic novel you get these wonderful drawings it's particularly with Beth and Tamara actually of when once the characters have gone and the scene has ended their final reaction which actually tells mu so much of the story mm -hmm. more than anything and so we yeah it was it was a gift to have that and often we would you know, you get so caught up when you're making the film in the script itself, and, and often we would refer back to the, the novel, and and then yeah, it, it would inform the performance so much. Um, I think st different people had different ways of working mm. with it, though. I know Dominic Cooper didn't really use the graphic novel at all because he yeah. felt like the character wasn't as rich in, in the book. But I do. <laughs> I use it all the time. I was like, Brilliant. <laughs> yeah, I think with um, with Beth certainly. I mean, when I saw the graphic novel and and saw the the character that they wanted me to play, I was, I thought it was wonderful that they even thought that I could manage to you know to play somebody like that yeah. and um, so I spent a lot of time with the um, the costume designer Consolata Boyle um, actually finding a way to create those contours because Posey draws characters mm. with in particular shapes and so you had to find the right shape and the and you know the, the sort of the fabric that they use for her for each of the clothes that you know mm. are so important to, mm. to yeah. find the you know the edges or the softness of somebody yeah. And uh, and then you create a whole from that. Uh, the, the film's a comedy, and Tamsin, you, you've got a lot of experience of doing comedy for television, with, uh, for, for uh, series like Green Wing and, and Black Books. How is do, do you find it at all different doing comedy on film? And is there is there a different pace there? Is there a different? Not that your character is a particularly comic character in this in some ways, but is there is there a different pace? Is, is it a different experience for you? <laughs> Well, I think the thing about film, I mean, I'm sure you, you, you know this because you've done so much of it, is that, you know, film is very um, uh, exacting it, and it's high definition, you know, it sees right up close. So there has to be a genuineness about the performance. So you can't just play 
funny lines. You can't go, I'm going to make this bit humorous or find the you know the comic beat here. You simply have to play the truth of the characters. Mm. And um, you know that bit there when she, when when Beth is looking at her coming towards her and says she's poured herself into those shorts. Mm. She means it. And when she <laughs> says, I hope they don't give her thrush. She means it, <laughs> you know. She because yeah, she's yeah. an eternal warrior. Yeah. She worries about you know the the consequences of people's actions, and uh, the fact that they've got the most wonderful pause in between those two lines. You know, that's the editors. They're finding the you yeah. know the, the comic beats. All you have to do is 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 speak the truth as the character knows it. Yeah, for sure. I know. I know. I was just, I was watching an interview with Stephen Frears earlier today, and he was saying that he feels that sometimes comedy on film is. In some ways underrated as a craft. I mean, pe people think it's, you know, assume it's much more difficult to craft a, a serious drama than it is to, to get a comedy right. But you know, he, he, you know, he, he was saying that you know, comedy lives or dies on whether someone laughs or not in the room. And if you don't get that right, you've absolutely failed. <laughs> I mean, how, how, I wonder if, I'd just like to know a little bit, before we see the next clip, a little bit about how Stephen works as a director, actually. How, you know, both generally as a director, as you both experienced working him on this, and also as a comic director as well. How, how, would, you, how would you describe him? Um, I, I don't know if my character isn't particularly comic and um, she's actually probably the most tragic so mm. but then I did see him working with the two girls um, who are you haven't seen it but they're, they're really funny they're, they're yeah. probably the most comic characters in yeah. the whole piece and yeah he just has fun he encourages silliness doesn't he <laughs> and um, and uh, and he doesn't. Ha I don't think he has a particular idea of what he wants on from the off, you know from the offset and, and goes with it. And um, I felt I felt like he, he would often just sort of shrug and say, I don't know, do what you want. So, you know, he let us get on with it. And, yeah. Um, yeah. But he he he's also gets around himself a you know really wonderful crew who have been yeah. on a lot of films. Yeah. And he trusts people to do their job. And I think he treats actors in the same way. Mm. Is that you know it's not a crash. He yeah. expects you to turn up and know yeah. what you're doing. Yeah. And he just allows yeah. this environment where he goes well just just do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and also he has an amazing casting director Leo mm. Davis. I think she really is responsible for the chemistry of, this, of the actors, and that's often what it is on set. You know, the casting is so crucial, but more so it's, it's how the, the actors relate to one another. And I felt like it just was so natural, yeah. especially with the girls. Again, you know, they, they're, they're so perfectly cast, and they, the way they work together, kind of it just happened when they were on set then. And so Stephen would say, well, they're doing it, you know. And Stephen was very clear from the beginning that he said if he was going to make the film, he didn't want to do it with huge stars. Yeah. And then he got Gemma yeah. Otterton. <laughs> yeah, but... <laughs> but got you at just the right me. time, you know, so that he said he couldn't have made the film if, it w if there were, you know, massive names. Because yeah. what you get is then a group of actors just doing the job mm. rather mm. than pulling it in any, any particular direction. You, you were saying just before we came on that you, you shot this uh, almost exactly a year ago, so last, la last September. Je Gemma, wh where, where were you in terms of... I mean, we've seen you in Clash of the Titans, uh, Prince of Persia and Disappearance of Annis Creed, all fairly recently, all, within the, all, the, all this year on screens. Where, where, where did this film fit in terms of making those? This was the final one of the year. I'd yeah. just come off of Clash of the Titans. Yeah, um, yeah it was like um, coming home for me. I was utterly refreshed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, you know, real. And yeah. yeah. It was so, yeah, it was how it should be, filmmaking at its sort of best, I think, because there was no nonsense. Did, did you feel you needed that after, after doing those huge productions? Yeah, you know, with I, their own, they had very different ways of doing things on green mm, screen. I yeah. just felt, I, I felt lost on those films, actually. Mm. I didn't really know what we were trying to achieve, because the script wasn't ready. <laughs> yeah. Whereas with this, there was no way we were going to mess around with the script. It was yeah. so brilliant, yeah. so yeah, brilliantly yeah, yeah. written by Moira Buffini. Yeah. And but she was also on set a lot of the time, mm. and, and Stephen yeah. does this thing where he kind of smells smells when something's not quite right. He, he just stands mm. in the middle of the of the set and just and he goes hold on and he just mm. sort of senses that something's not quite right. And then he will work with Moira on set to say look, look this 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 bit. And he talks about stories as being as consequential and he sees mm. in his mind how stories have to be set up and he knows when it's not quite working. Often he can't <laughs> express it, so it can be you know frustrating and you think I'm yeah. I'm not getting what you're asked him to do mm. but he just waits until he knows what it is he says this great thing he said 
solutions are waiting to be found. They're the easy part. He said the difficult part is finding out the problems. Mm. He said asking the right questions. That's yeah. the difficult bit. And he stands and just asks the right questions. Mm. Mm. Let, let, let's see the second clip. Um, th this clip is uh, it's a scene at the home of uh, Samson's character, Beth. Um, so she's in the scene. Her husband, Nicholas, I think is at the head of the table. And everyone else around the table are their guests who have come to their home for a literary retreat, which they're hosting. I think you can see from that clip that it's, it's a writer's film in, in several ways. Obviously, we see there people are discussing writing, discussing literature, the characters of writers, are wannabe writers, but you can also see how rich the script is there as well. I mean, it's, a, it's a film where the, the dialogue is very, very sharp. Um, when, Tamsin, when you read the script, and what, one of the things, one of the common reactions to the film, certainly one I had and the other people have had, is that it, 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 it's actually quite an unusual film in terms of British cinema. And that, you know, it's set in a rural, it's, it's sharp, it's funny, it's well observed, but it's also set in a rural setting. It's unashamedly middle class. Mm -hmm. People are discussing. And you know, in the first clip, someone mentions the Independent. There's a, there's a version of the Hay Festival. Uh, James Nockerty from Radio Four even has a cameo in it. It couldn't. It couldn't. <laughs> It really occupies a particular sort of Englishness. I mean, did that, did, did that attract you when, you when you read it? Did it? Did it surprise you and did it attract you when you read it? I, I mean, there's a part of you that thinks um, this will never get made because, mm. you know, yeah. it's not cutting edge enough. You know, it's not, it's not Ken Loach, it's not Shane Meadows. You know, who wants yeah. to, to go to, to the cinema and, and spend time with Radio 4 listeners? Yeah. Uh, you know, the yeah. miracle is, is the UK Film Council did put money up for it, yeah. you know, yeah. because... Um, Stephen Frears thinks that the middle class are a peculiar breed that mm. deserve to be looked at under a microscope and yeah. seen with all their flaws and weaknesses and foibles and ridiculousnesses. Yeah. And, you know, he's, he's sort of honoured that. It's curious, though, that TV, is, t t TV does that happily, radio does that happily, theatre does that happily in terms of investigating all levels of British society and everything, but film seems to be much more nervous about, about doing it, as if... Uh, you know, there's the worry that said that people don't want to go in and see that, and I think this 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 film will will prove that you know not to be the case. That you, know, you, you can invest, you can cover those 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 sorts of areas, and those sorts of people in a funny and in a smart way. Did did it surprise you when you when you read it? Well, uh, I don't know this you, world at all because I you, grew I grew up in the sort of Ken Loach-esque film <laughs> on the council estate, so I didn't. Yeah. So it surprised me the script. It was. You know, I wanted to sort of go there and, and see what it was like. And yeah, I, I didn't know if it was going to translate very well, you know, internationally. Yeah. Because, uh, and it, apparently it has. And because it's so British. But then if you think about very successful British comedies, they have sort of been about the middle class, haven't they? Like Notting Hill and. Yeah, you yeah. Know, well, some, someone did the Four Weddings. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. someone apparently yeah. said to Stephen Frears, which I think he was quite pleased about, they watched Tamara Drew and said, well, it's like Richard Curtis with balls. Yes, that's right, yeah. <laughs> Richard <laughs> Curtis with balls. But there's, you know, there's something dirtier and, um, and yeah. less, less manageable mm. yeah. about this film. Yeah. I, I, I realise that time is running away with us little, so I'm going to move straight on to the third clip now, please. This um, clip is a scene between uh, Gemma's character, Tamara, and her uh, boyfriend at the time is called Ben, played by Dominic Cooper, who's also uh, the drummer in a band. And they initially meet because you come, you've, one of the reasons you're in the area is to interview him because he's playing at a local festival. <laughs> it's definitely one of the film's many, many funny scenes. And uh, Dominic Cooper gives a great over-the-top performance mm. as, uh, as, as, that, as, the, as, uh, as Ben, the drummer in the band. It, it struck me actually when I, when I watched the film a second time the other day, that there's some, although your characters, Tamara and, um, and Beth, are on the surface quite different, you know, Tamara's open, confident, independent, and you're in some way, Beth is somehow stuck, some, some way stuck in this marriage. And bo both of you don't really seem to see the truth about the men in your lives. I mean, we know, it's obvious to us that your, your husband's a philanderer, but Ben as well is, mm. that, that clip hints a little, you know, he, he's, he's not the most likable of characters. Mm. Your, your character is head over heels in love with him, and we, we question his, you know, his mm. motives as well. Mm. There seems to be that, that link between the two. Yeah, yeah, and I, but I think as well, Stephen Frears is really interested in looking at, at the um, Englishness of, mm. of our behavior, is that we wear so many masks, and yeah. that you know, English behavior is, um, is, is a front, and he's interested in scratching below the surface of, of, of why we pretend that everything's all right or why mm. we uh, put over a, a performance of confidence and self-control when, mm. when actually underneath all is fear and, and mis mis misunderstanding. 
Yeah. And that's in some ways, you, you, see, you see that through the very look of the film in some ways, you know, sort of sunny and kind of rural and pastoral on the surface and all these things are bubbling under. I think when you do go to see it, Gemma was talking about two, uh, the, two, the characters of the two teenage girls who pop up every now and then. They're, they're, in some ways, well, they are separate from the main characters we are watching, but every now and then we see them talking at the bus shelter or walking through the fields, uh, observing what's going on and talking about it in a, you know, in, in a way that kind of reflects the fact they've been reading a lot of Heat magazine and women's magazines and watching a lot of trashy TV as well. And they're, they're a great comic chorus in the film as well, I think. Um, I'd like to take questions from, from you. I hope there are some out there. Um, anyone like to start off? Please don't be shy. If not, I'm going to... OK. There is a microphone going around as well, so please wait for that. Uh, hello. Uh, am I on? I'm loud. Yeah, I can hear I'm, you. I'm, I'm fantastic. Um, I guess my question to Gemma is, uh, obviously, as was mentioned before, we've seen you an awful lot on the big screen over the last year. We've also seen you in the West End. And I guess I wondered, as a performer, which you enjoyed more? Because we obviously enjoy watching you in both. But uh, do you find theatre or film a slightly more visceral experience? Um, um, I, I, I think I prefer the process of um, theatre. <laughs> um, I love it, the rehearsing, you know. It's brilliant. Um, and film is different in a diff it's different because it's, you're always all the way through filming you're kind of rehearsing as well you're never putting out the finished product um, but it depends it really does depend on the job because uh, I loved Tamara Drew I loved making it so much it was like and I loved Alice Creed as well because it was like making a f it was like theater you know um, but it really does depend on the job they're so different unbelievably different um. <laughs> and, and Samson, you, you, as I said before, you move a lot between um, radio, theatre, TV, TV, and film. Is, is that having that, is that? Do you find that variety? That variety really sort of keep, keeps your enthusiasm, keeps your energy going. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But it's just sort of the different, you know, techniques that you have to bring to each job that, that you know that that keep you keep your muscles oiled. Yeah. And uh, I mean, we did um, tomorrow do last year, and then. And then you know it was I was fortunate enough to, to go on to my next job with Gemma, and it was in mm. the theatre. So you know yeah. we were working together in completely different mediums with different approaches, and it was you know such a brilliant way of mm. of of continuing you know a working relationship. Was that the little little dog laughed here in the West End? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tamsin, I must apologise. I didn't realise before um, before researching this evening actually, you also play a long-running character in The Archers, uh, <laughs> which, which seems to me a an unusual connection with this film. It's been described as a sexed up version or a dirty version of the arches in some way. Yeah. And I didn't yeah. realise I didn't realise you actually played a character. Yeah, I know. I've got a perfect body for radio. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there another question out there please? Anybody? Yeah, there's one there. There's one there and I'll come down here. If you could just wait for the microphone, please. <laughs> Um, I, I feel a little bit now after uh, hearing this that I might need a bit of a study guide before I see the film. Is there anything you can say to kind of reassure me that, uh, that I'll, I'll be able to, to get it and enjoy it without knowing all the, the literary context and everything? Well, as an independent observer, I can say you don't. Just go and see it. It's fun and I think you'll, you'll enjoy it and it'll wash over you. But the experts can def defend it as well. I think the film, I honestly think that it's a great film and that you get that when you watch it. And we're just talk talking about it, but you don't need to know all of this stuff. You don't even need to know that it's from, it's loosely based on Far From The Madding Crowd. It's, you know, it's, it's so loosely based on that, isn't it? It's kind of <laughs> an, an, annihilated it. Um, but yeah, you, it's, it's just, um, Stephen's done an amazing job, at, uh, you do get all of that, you know. It's, there's, it's a very much an ensemble film. And there are so many really, beautifully rich characters and they're all very strong and well played and um you know it's none of none of it's lost i don't think yeah and you, Stephen said you know he read the script he knew the, the 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 graphic novel and had read it in the guardian when it was a, when it was serialized but he um he said he couldn't believe it when it came and it landed on his lap and he just started reading it and thought this is a wonderful gift it's funny it's sharp it's witty it's sexy and it's just a wonderful standalone story that just, you know, it just comes at you. You don't, you know, you don't need any help. 
it's also quite farcical as well. I mean, although, although there are people sitting around dinner tables discussing literature, there's also scenes with stampedes involving cows and, you know, and a lot of bonking as well. So it's, it's quite... <laughs> It's not a Yeah, now. it's quite a good no. idea. Yeah, go and see it because there's a lot of bonking. <laughs> I'm now sold, thank you. <laughs> good, hope one more ticket sold. <laughs> there's uh, someone down here, please. Uh, Tamsin, you said that uh, the roles you played before were very likable to you. You liked uh, Green... Uh, I, I know you from obviously Green Wing and the Black Works, which was excellent, by the way. <laughs> um, but and you say this role is very different uh, for you in these cases. I mean, it, it, do you find that the roles that came before were very similar to your personality type, or, or are they just things you enjoyed doing that much? And this one was more threatening to you, or is, is there a type of role you enjoy playing more? Well, that's a very interesting question. I, I um, maybe it's my problem actually that I <laughs> that I make them too likable. You know, I find that if you're going to have to spend time with a character, you, you, you know, you're going to have to find ways to like them because otherwise it's too painful. And, you know, Beth's journey in that is, is very painful. And she does, you know, there's a lot of tears and a lot of snot and a lot of throwing plants around. And, um, and there are two big fight scenes in this between me and um, Roger Allen. We happen to do them in the same week because of, you know, locations and everything. And I did, um, I did worry with Stephen about, you know, the fact that it was just, it was just too painful. It was, there was one note, and I, and and you know, Stephen obviously knew that there was a there was a bigger um, journey arc, and uh, then I didn't see that. But um, the the play that I did with Gemma, I found very hard to do, not because it was a Gemma, but because. Um, <laughs> Um, but because the, par the part that I was playing was such an unpleasant woman that I, I struggled to, you know, not to judge her. Again, it's the, my prejudice for them. So Do you have to find a way to like them. Uh, otherwise, it's just... Um, and, you know, you've got legs. You'll walk out <laughs> if you don't want to spend time with them. So, yeah. Maybe I should just play like an utter bastard and, <laughs> and, and watch you all leave. <laughs> Is there another question, please? Uh, there's one down there. Again, the microphone's coming to you. <laughs> um, comparing Stephen to other directors that you've worked with, is there like a special style that he uses or is there like an odd quirk that he has with it about him or, or anything like that? Any odd quirks? <laughs> I, I think that it's his... Um, he's, he's so self-deprecating. And um, <laughs> sometimes we would ask him as actors, as insecure actors, <laughs> Ah, um, is it all right? And he'd go, I don't know. Why are you asking me? I don't know what I'm doing. And they're like, well, you he did are actually say a number of times, I'm the last person you should ask. <laughs> <laughs> he would actually say on set. So which sort of, you think, oh, brilliant. You, you must trust me. Yeah. And then you, on bad days, it was like, oh, shit. You don't know either. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, but it was just his way of going, just, just do it. Just do it. <laughs> you don't need my help. Mm. Just do it. When actually, you know, everybody does need a bit of help. And there were times when he would just, he would just say one thing. Mm. And actually, it was very interesting seeing how his very loyal crew works around him. When he's not there, when he's offset, when he's got to go and look at other things, whatever, it's like the chickens are getting out of the coop. You know, it all just starts to just yeah. run away, and he—he's he, this incredible center of, um, of, of focus, that makes it all, and it all goes through him in a, in a in a in a in a non kind of me way. It's really interesting. And he has such a, a quiet command on set as well, which is really great. So I've worked with directors who get completely. You know, they 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 can't can't control what's going on and get really lost, and he just quietly commands it, and it's so nice to know everybody needs that in a way, you know. But he also loves a bit of silliness, you know. So he's very happy for you know. I had to do a lot of silliness with Roger. It's not so serious. <laughs> so not so serious. Yeah. You know, he thinks it's really important for actors to piss about as well, you know, to find a, a, a dialogue and a, and a history. And you know, I needed to find that with Roger because. You know, it's just, it's so painful, the fact that he's a liar and she lets him be, and you have to find their history. So he does let you muck about as well. So you say he's laid back, but in a fun and mm. forceful way as well. Yeah, mm. like a sort of bloke who comes at Christmas. Mm. <laughs> he, he likes to watch you piss about. <laughs> I 
don't know if there's another, is there another question from the audience. If not, I'm going to take one question from uh, the iTunes fan page on Facebook. I'm going to have to admit quite a few of them because there are questions like, what's your favourite type of cheese? Oh, I think there's a... Uh, do you like otters? Um, but there's one from Casey McDonough, which is, what was your favourite bit of the movie to act and why? I'll ask you both. So Tam's in first. What was your favourite bit of the movie to act and why? Favourite scene? There's a scene where... Um, there are only two points in the scene where, where Gemma and I actually work together. <laughs> oh, my God, are you really going to say it's that? <laughs> and there's a bit where, where we come together and discover... I'm not going to give it away, but we, we come together and discover something terrible. And... Um, <laughs> And it was just wonderful because something just happened in, in the moment of, of us coming together, which, you know, is not scripted and it's not, um, it wasn't di particularly directed. And it, it was just, um, it sort of made me tingle doing it. It was, it was really special that mm. day. Mm. My favourite scene was... Um, it's not I, with me. I, it wasn't actually. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to reciprocate. I hated that scene, by the way. But it was awful. <laughs> no. Um, I have three lovers in the film, and um, one of them, who you haven't seen, um, is called Luke Evans. And uh, there's this really beautiful scene where he's in love with my character, but I'm not really into him at this point, but I'm using him. <laughs> it's just such a horrible... And I come home and he, he was just adore. I come home and he's sort of drawn up all these plans on how he's going to decorate my house. And um, he really is st got has stars in his eyes and I just mess him, you know, I, I mess him about and <laughs> tease him and it was really fun to play. <laughs> it was, it was good Why fun. Why did they ask you to play this part? I don't know. It's weird, isn't it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we're, gonna ha we're running out of time, so we're going to have to wrap up there. I just want to remind everyone that Tomorrow Drew is opening on Friday, so please do go and see it. Um, and tell your friends to go and see it as well. And most of all, I just want to thank Tamsin Gregg and Gemma Arston for being here tonight. Thank you both very thank much. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.